before you became Secretary of Defense in 1969, were you aware that President Nixon had a plan for Vietnam, the one he discussed in his campaign? And what was your perception of what the plan was? Well, at that particular time, a definite plan had not been worked out. It was my responsibility after I became Secretary of Defense to go to Vietnam and uh, come up with a plan that would be followed by the administration. And, of course, that was the Vietnamization plan that was outlined uh, to the Congress and the American people in April. Now, what was your, your plan for troop withdrawals from Vietnam? And what kind of pressures on one side or another were there for withdrawals? Well, Vietnamization was not just a plan for troop withdrawals. For four years, the war had been Americanized in Vietnam. And the policy of the Johnson administration, as a matter of fact, starting in 1963 when President Kennedy made the decision to turn over military combat responsibility to the American forces in Vietnam, that decision was made in 63. We went from 357,000, I mean, 357 troops to about 6,000 troops in a very short period of time. And a policy of Americanization was followed from 63 and through 68. The policy of Vietnamization was to turn over the responsibility for the ground combat and air combat to the South Vietnamese. It, it was a policy of giving them the equipment and the training so that they could follow out their responsibility to their country. You cannot guarantee the will and the desire of any country, but you can give them the tools to do the job. We had not been giving them the tools to do the job. We had been doing the job for them from 63 to 68. Where were the pressures coming from on one side or the other, either for withdrawal of the American troops? Were there pressures for withdrawal and pressures against withdrawal? Well, I think the American people had become fed up with the Vietnam War and the fact that American troops had been uh, become bogged down there and had taken over the complete responsibility. Uh, I, I believe that there were pressures uh, that were felt from the Congress, and certainly during the campaign, I think if President Humphrey, uh, or Vice President Humphrey at that time, uh, would have indicated in the slightest that there was another plan to get Americans out of Vietnam because each year during McNamara's term the number of troops went up and up and up during that Johnson administration. During Clark Clifford's ten months in the, as Secretary of Defense during the end of the Johnson administration, the number of troops went up and up and up. Uh, and I think if Humphrey would have indicated that there was some plan, he probably would have won the election. Uh, but as you know, President Johnson uh, had uh, Clark Clifford go on Meet the Press uh, two weeks before the uh, November election of 1968 and indicated to the American people that there was no plan to remove a single American from Vietnam. And this position was echoed by the then Vice President, the Democratic candidate for President of the United States, that they had no plan to withdraw any Americans. Matter of fact, uh, Secretary of Defense Clifford at the time, uh, when I came out and said there was a plan in the Pentagon and that that plan uh, should be implemented, uh, denied that there was even a plan in ISA or any other place in the Pentagon to withdraw a single American from Vietnam. I think that was a mistake. Because the pressures were on as far as the American people were concerned. The pressures were on as far as the Congress was concerned. And if we wouldn't have moved in the direction of Vietnamization, our whole military force structure would have been destroyed in the United States, and we would not have been able to meet the NATO commitments and the other commitments which were treaty commitments that had been made by, had been made by the American government. Because the Defense Department was suffering, the... Uh, military acceptance of even people, the military people, uh, was going down, and it was necessary for us to come up with a plan that would give the South Vietnamese the responsibility in that area. We couldn't assure that they had the will and the desire to carry forward. We couldn't estimate that the Russians wouldn't live up to the peace agreement of Paris. 
But uh, certainly uh, we had to act, and uh, I felt that the pressures were on from the Congress and from the American people. Matter of fact, there was my plans for withdrawal were always in greater numbers than it really were approved. But I had to keep the pressure on on the withdrawal program from the time of Midway in late May of 1969, uh, right through the four years I served in the Pentagon. Where was the resistance to withdrawal coming from? Was it coming from the Joint Chiefs? Was it coming from Kissinger? Could you explain? Both areas. There was some resistance that my program was uh, too rapid. Where was the resistance coming from? From both. What could you start out? I, I, I don't, how do you I'm mean sorry. by numbers? No, no. Could you, could you actually say who was resisting the withdrawal? I would say that there was resistance from both areas as to the numbers I recommended. I'm sorry. I, uh, the I'm numbers not, of the withdrawal. No, I mean, was the joint, were the Joint Chiefs resisting it? Was Kissinger resisting it? Was Nixon In both areas, the numbers that I recommended were greater than sometimes the numbers approved. Well, for example, in, in 1970, in April 1970, you met with Nixon and urged him to withdraw 60,000 men by November, sort of pointing out that the election pressures were, were building up. Could you recall that meeting with Nixon and what he said to you and how, what, what exchanges you went through? Well, I, I, I had a program that was worked out well in advance as to the manner in which we could turn over the responsibilities to the South Vietnamese. My program levels were always just a little greater than those that were finally approved, but they were uh, somewhere in the uh, general ballpark. Uh, you're talking about 20 or 30,000 differences from time to time. But the program that I'd worked out uh, in uh, early in 1969 was generally followed. The numbers were not always the same. My numbers were somewhat larger as far as the actual withdrawal figures were concerned. Uh, I want to make clear that I had tremendous support from General Abrams. Sometimes the Joint Chiefs were not as supportive as uh, Abe was over in Vietnam. Abe gave me tremendous support on all of the withdrawal figures and on the entire Vietnamization program. He understood what the atmosphere was in the United States and the need to change the policy of uh, the Defense Department under McNamara and Clifford. And he gave me tremendous support. Uh, I wrote a little article about that for the Reader's Digest uh, on Abe and uh, the tremendous support that he gave me as the military commander in Vietnam. Did you what kind of relationship did you have with President Nixon as far as your withdrawal plan was concerned? He generally was supportive. Uh, there were some differences as far as the figures uh, from time to time, but uh, certainly he gave tremendous support to the whole Vietnamization program and turning over the responsibility to the South Vietnamese. Now, I want to ask you what kind of re relationship you had and what kind of support or opposition you had from Kissinger. Could you mention his name when you answer the question? I have fine support from uh, sec uh, Secretary Kissinger. Uh, at that particular time, he was the uh, presidential advisor on national security affairs. I had known him, I guess, longer than anyone in the administration. We had, he had contributed to a book which I had edited in 1960, and I had known him over the years. And I would say that uh, he gave me uh, good support uh, on the Vietnamization program, as well as the Defense Department budget. I had, uh, if, of course, one of my, I had two goals in mind when I became Secretary of Defense. Uh, one of them was to uh, get uh, America disengaged from uh, Southeast Asia because I always had been a supporter of General Eisenhower. And uh, when he was president, he said we should never get bogged down in a land war in Southeast Asia. And I supported him in the Congress all during the 50s on that issue and right uh, all through the 1960s on that particular issue. Uh, Secretary Kissinger, then the presidential advisor, gave me good support on the Vietnamization program. There were some difference sometime in the figures. Perhaps I was for a little more rapid implementation of Vietnamization. Uh, he gave me good support in my uh, change in the draft. That was one of my goals, to get the draft fair. It was unfair with all of the deferments. They told me I couldn't establish a lottery thing. It would never be approved by the Congress. 
I got it approved by the Congress, and I moved forward to the volunteer force. And when I left defense, selective service was not being used to draft young men and women into the military services. And I got good support from uh, President Nixon and the National Security Advisor, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, on those programs. Did you have a Well, I was very close to the Congress, having come from the Congress and spent nine terms in the House of Representatives on the Defense Appropriations Committee. And I can only say that the Congress gave me 100 percent support. I never lost a single vote during the time I was Secretary of Defense. I had great support in the House of Representatives and in the United States Senate. And for that, I will always be grateful. To get to this question of, of, of what was, in your mind, uh, the proportion, let's say, of domestic politics as it related to Vietnam. I mean, do you see Vietnam as a domestic political issue, basically? I think it would have been a tremendous domestic political issue, even greater than it was, if President Nixon would not have approved the Vietnamization program. I think that uh, that gave him time to move forward on other domestic issues, and it quieted the tremendous discontent that had been built up from 66 to 68 over the Vietnam issue. Uh, I think that the press in this country, the media, was supportive of the phased withdrawal program in Vietnam. And I think that they uh, did understand what was being done, that there was a tremendous buildup had gone on there when President Nixon became president and I became Secretary of Defense. There were 550,000 Americans on the ground engaged in ground combat. There was another million Americans engaged in air and sea support of that effort. And uh, I believe that uh, the American people, the press, the radio, TV, the media people generally did a very good job in supporting this change of direction that came about early in the Nixon administration. Why did you think Vietnamization was working? You took these trips to Vietnam, but you remember there was the, the incursion into Laos, which was presumably a test of Vietnamization. It didn't really work very well. I mean, what were your measures for judging? You think well, I thought the Vietnamese handled themselves very well on those missions. Uh, they had, uh, that was early in the Vietnamization program, but uh, they did handle themselves uh, very well. There was no question in my mind that they could do the job. I did not believe that they were weaker individually than North Vietnamese. I felt they came from the same stock and they could do the job if they had the will and the desire to do it. Now, there's no way that you can instill the will and the desire into a nation. There's no way that you could foresee the amount of military equipment and aid that the Russians were putting into North Vietnam in violation of the peace agreement that uh, Advisor Kissinger had negotiated in Paris. But uh, I do believe that uh, they uh, were capable of handling the military situation. But when you planned Vietnamization, when you conceived of it and you pushed it, was it predicated on, on the Vietnamese, our South Vietnamese, continuing to get American support as long as possible? Stanley, excuse me, you, you left off over a little bit. Uh, it was conceived on the idea that Larry, there me. would be no... Could you start again? It was conceived on the idea that there would only be replacements placed in the country by the United States, replacement and spare parts for their equipment. And it was also predicated upon the conditions that were outlined in the Paris Peace Accord, which the Russians and the Chinese would follow the same rules as far as... Excuse me, we're getting, you're getting a little ahead of yourself. The, the Peace Accord doesn't come till 73. We're talking now about... The Peace Accord came, uh, the, as you know, the Peace Accord started in the negotiations, and those particular provisions were agreed upon in 71. I'm sorry, did you repeat that, that the, that the, that 
the Russians had agreed not to continue supplying in Sahel? No, the, the peace accord discussion started in 1969, but it was always anticipated through all of the discussions that there would be a provision that only spare parts and no new equipment would be placed in the north by the Russians and the Chinese. When the peace accord was finally signed in 1973, early in 73, I think it was about January 23rd, I may be off a day or two on the date, that particular provision that had always been part of the discussions and always a very important part of the Vietnamization program was in the agreement. But before the agreement was signed, we were sending in all kinds of stuff, the Enhanced Plus program. So were the Russians, but it was anticipated that once the peace agreement was, uh, peace agreement was signed, that there would be only replacements from the United States and from uh, the Russians and the Red Chinese. I'm sure you're familiar with that provision. Were you concerned about the morale of the American troops in Vietnam towards Let's talk, let's talk about 1971, early 1972, drugs, craggings. Uh, could you discuss that? Yes, it was. And we had a program Sorry, that we... Sorry, repeat the subject? We had a program that was going forward there uh, under General Abrams' uh, very fine leadership to deal with uh, the drug problem, which became a very severe problem as far as uh, Vietnam was concerned. And I think General Abrams and his people... Uh, move forward uh, on that program uh, very uh, adequately. I had to sometimes uh, uh, keep after them a little bit because uh, they were involved in the training programs and turning over the responsibility to the Vietnamese. And uh, it was necessary to get after them from time to time uh, on those other personal uh, military problems that did exist as far as our troops were concerned. Were you concerned that there might be a backlash from the American military if Vietnam didn't produce a victory? How, how did you keep the military together? The military uh, became a very much a, a part of the Vietnamization program. Not only did I have General Abrams' support, but I had support of most people that had looked over the challenges which the United States faced as we moved into the decade of the 1970s and the 1980s. During the Johnson administration, we had robbed our NATO forces of some $10 billion worth of equipment. As you know, when I was in Congress, I accused uh, Secretary McNamara and President Johnson of following a program of fighting now, paying later. And uh, I felt that uh, they had underfunded the budget and were robbing our NATO forces and other forces all over the world. Uh, and when I became Secretary of Defense, I found out that that's exactly what they'd done. And our military understood that. They understood that if we were going to get the kind of support that was needed and necessary for the military forces in the 70s and on into the 80s, that we had to build up American support for military people. People are the most important thing in the military. Tanks and airplanes and ships are very secondary. But we didn't have the kind of support that was needed and necessary because there was a lot of disenchantment from 1965 to 1968 with the Department of Defense and with our military personnel. So what I tried to do is develop a program of participatory management in the Department of Defense to bring the military leadership and the civilian leadership together. We started out very early with a conference at Airlie in which I took them for three days. And we sat down and went over all of the problems of uh, the deterrent force of the United States as it met its treaty commitments. The Vietnam commitment was not a treaty commitment. It was not a commitment that had been approved uh, constitutionally as uh, all treaties are approved, but it was something entirely different. And so we tried to bring the military and the civilian leadership together to plan for the future. And the way to plan for the future was to disengage Americans from the kind of activity that they'd gotten involved in in Vietnam and to turn that responsibility over to the people there. 
You know, Southeast Asia, the wars have gone on there for hundreds of years. They will be fighting in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam for the next 50 years. And we have to understand that. There's not much we're going to be able to do about that. We're not in a position where we should choose that area of the world to become involved in ground combat. I remember so well uh, General Eisenhower, and I traveled with him in the campaign in 1952, in which he outlined uh, his speech that he would go to Korea because he felt it was a mistake for America to get bogged down in that kind of land combat in Southeast Asia. I became a disciple of the Eisenhower philosophy as far as that area of the world was concerned. And that's why with participatory management, getting our eye back on the ball as to what American commitments were and what the important commitments, military and from a foreign policy and a national security viewpoint were in the world in which we lived. Why did you have reservations about bombing Cambodia in 1969, and what changed your mind about it? I didn't have any reservations about bombing Cambodia in 1969. My disagreement with the president and with Kissinger and with the Secretary of State were keeping them secret. I recommended bombing the Cambodian sanctuaries in 1969, and I think there's some misunderstanding about that. My recommendation was to bomb those sanctuaries which were occupied by the North Vietnamese which they were using after they attacked American forces and running back in the sanctuaries. I had no reservation about the bombing of those occupied sanctuaries in 1969. But I didn't want it kept secret because I felt I could get the support of the Congress and the American people to protect American troops in South Vietnam as we withdrew. And I felt it could not be kept secret because I had 16,000 military people that would have to be involved, and I told the National Security Council, the President, the Presidential Advisor for National Security, and the Secretary of State, that their proposal to keep it secret just would not work. And that's my disagreement. And I think it's been misinterpreted. It did not have to do with the bombing. It had to do in the manner in which they wanted to carry out that bombing which I thought would lead to trouble. And I felt I could get the kind of support that I needed from the American people and from the Congress to go forward with it, and I did not want it on a secret basis, and that's where the disagreement uh, existed. Why did you have reservations about putting U.S. ground troops into Cambodia in 1970? In 1970, I felt that it was important to use... I'm sorry. The could you move your shoulder one more time, please, and I'm as far as you can go. I felt it was very important to use uh, South Vietnamese troops in 1970, not only in the incursions in Laos, but also in the incursions in Cambodia. I felt that it was absolutely essential to give them that kind of training and that kind of responsibility. As you know, the military commanders, U.S. military commanders, felt that you could not guarantee success without using Americans. I disagreed with that particular proposal. I felt that it should be the responsibility and give the South Vietnamese the complete test at that time. What, <clears throat> how did you see the results of the Cambodian incursion? Did you think uh, the Cambodian invasion, do you think it was successful or not? Now the results show that it was successful at that particular time. I was not sure whether the uh, incursion was successful. But now, as you know, as we go over the reports from both sides that we've had recently, uh, that was a successful incursion. But I still believe that it would have been better to give that total responsibility to the South Vietnamese. Did you anticipate the domestic opposition that would take place when the attack against Cambodia happened? And how did you feel at the time that it happened? Well, at that particular time, I felt by using American troops in Cambodia instead of using the South Vietnamese troops, 
that it might set back the kind of support that was needed and necessary to carry Vietnamization out for the full course. And it did cause some problems. And I had anticipated those problems, and I had outlined those problems at a National Security Council meeting. Uh, because I felt that at that particular time we had to do everything we could to bring the Congress together, bring the American people together to support our overall program of withdrawal and turning over the responsibility to the South Vietnamese. Could you recall to us what was your reaction uh, when we had that outburst at the time of the Cambodian incursion, Kent State, kids demonstrating and so forth in Washington? What was your own personal reaction to that? Of course, I was very uh, concerned about it. My reaction was great, deep concern. Could you elaborate a little more? What, what kind of moves would you have recommended one take to, to meet that kind of... Well, I had anticipated that there would be that sort of reaction if we moved forward and used American forces uh, in that operation. I just want to go back now. There's, there seems to be a feeling uh, in the country and among many people that the defeat in Vietnam, the thing that defeated us, was not communists in Vietnam, but the politicians back home. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, I don't think we were defeated in Vietnam. I think the South Vietnamese were defeated. The South Vietnamese were defeated not for lack of equipment or training, but because of a lack of will and desire to face up to the North Vietnamese and the increasing support the North Vietnamese were getting during that period from the Soviet Union. I think that defeat was a defeat for the South Vietnamese. I see there's no question about that. But I don't believe that it was the responsibility of the American people, the American Congress, or any American administration to take over complete and total responsibility for ensuring the will and the desire of another country to resist their neighbors to the north. Looking at the world today, post-Vietnam world, what has Vietnam done to us domestically and in our foreign posture? Well, I would hope that it, uh, Vietnam would reestablish the Eisenhower Doctrine I call it the Eisenhower Doctrine as far as Southeast Asia is concerned and as far as Asia is concerned. I think President Eisenhower was very wise in his advice to the Congress and to the American people that we should not get involved in ground combat in Southeast Asia or in Asia. And I think that uh, the experience of the Johnson and the Kennedy administration in changing American policy to one of ground combat responsibility is a lesson that uh, has well been well learned in the United States. What has Vietnam done to us domestically? What has it done to our society, in your estimation? Well, I think we've gotten over the, uh, the problems that were caused by the Kennedy-Johnson administration in engaging in uh, Southeast Asia. I think that the American people are now willing to support a credible deterrent as far as our military force is concerned. I think that they will be very careful in uh, instructing their members of the United States Senate on the kinds of on the kinds of treaties and military and national security commitments this country makes in the future. But I think the American people are willing to support the kind of national security and national defense policy that's needed and necessary for the free world to have a credible deterrent. Did you sometimes feel that your prerogatives as defense secretary were being usurped by Kissinger when he was the head of the National Security Council staff? And I think you discussed that. No, I had no problems with Secretary Kissinger usurping any of the authority of the Department of Defense while I served as uh, Secretary of Defense. I had disagreements with Secretary Kissinger, such as the Cambodian bombing. I didn't want it kept secret. I felt that was a mistake. Uh, his position uh, uh, prevailed. Uh, but as far as the kind of support I got from uh, the President and from the Secretary of State and from the National Security Advisor, uh, there certainly were some disagreements. But basically, I had strong support. As you know, when I became Secretary of Defense, I was not the first choice of the president. 
Uh, I had urged him to appoint Scoop Jackson as Secretary of Defense because I felt it was good to have a Democrat. Scoop backed out at the last minute because he uh, felt that it would interfere with the uh, possible presidential ambitions that he had. And uh, at the last minute, I became Secretary of Defense because I had evidently, the president thought, I'd let him up a blind alley on Scoop Jackson. And I'd been on the Defense Appropriations Committee a long time, and I decided to, that I should do this. Uh, but I did it with very strong understanding that I would have complete control over military and civilian personnel in that department, and that I'd also uh, have uh, access on all budgetary matters, that I would ha not have to go through the Office of uh, Management and Budget on those particular problems. Uh, I believe that uh, the support I got was uh, good support and strong support. I won most of my battles in the National Security Council. I can't say that I uh, won them all, but I can say that I won every battle that I got into or every issue that I get presented to the Congress of the United States, and I'll be forever in debt to the House of Representatives and the United States Senate for the tremendous support they gave to me and to the Department of Defense each and every one of those 48 months as I served as Secretary of Defense. Okay, good. Very good. Fine.